friends and enemies, Joe Pro writes here once again, and today I have another brand new episode of The Writer's Thoughts, and this time we have a very special guest, my longtime friend, someone I've met in person, amazing dude, great to finally have him on, Alec the Cleric. How you doing, my man? Dude, it is an honor and a pleasure to be brought on here tonight. I am I was so glad uh, when I got your message, like, hey, you think you could do a podcast with me? I'm like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh it's it's been far too long since you and i have podcasted together so it's good to get back on that horse yeah for sure and we used to host one a while back together so we know each other pretty well i know this is going to be a great one and i'm very excited but first off i did want to let everyone know make sure you like make sure you comment make sure you're subscribed wherever you are listening to this podcast it helps me out tremendously it allows more listeners to get their ears on this awesomeness and i appreciate each and every one of you the other thing, this is something that me and Alec have in common. Make sure you're swinging by geekytorch.com. We are both creators for that. You'll see YouTube videos. You'll see written articles from both of us. So definitely check out the website if you haven't already. I wanted to plug that because I've been remiss in not doing so lately. And they have been awesome to me. I, shame. I know. Shame. I know. I've been slacking. So I'm very excited. Uh, I'm. We're going to be doing amazing things over there. So definitely check that out. But without further ado, Alec, introduce yourself. Let me know where the audience can find you, what you got going on, a little bit about yourself. The floor is yours, my man. Absolutely. Well, I'm Alec the Cleric, and uh, I have been making content for a better part of uh, five to six years at this point. Um, I kind of go off and on. I, there's been a little while here where I haven't been able to make any content, but in the interim of that... I actually launched my own business, Transmutation Media, uh, and I currently do multimedia editing for podcasters, for YouTubers, uh, for Twitch streamers, uh, and I've really found a lot of enjoyment in kind of the back end of content creation, like actually getting into the nuts and bolts and, and editing stuff, but uh, I'm also at a point now where I can finally say that I'm ready to come back to creating my own content. Uh, so I do have a YouTube channel. Uh, you can search that up, Alec the Cleric, and I hopefully will get back to live streaming eventually soon, twitch.tv slash Alec the Cleric. Um, but if you're ever interested in any of the stuff I do, best places to find me is on Twitter. Uh, a little bit about myself in general. I am just a big, giant nerd um, Are in we all? all aspects. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. But I mean, I, I enjoy a little bit of everything uh there, there's not a whole lot that i haven't dipped my toes into it, as far as nerdum goes I'm, I'm the kind of guy who plays D and and enjoys a good anime and reads classic sci-fi but then also can get into like the more scientific nerdy type stuff and just basically and music music is a big thing for me like it really anything i can get my hands on i like to i like to go deep um so yeah that's just a little bit about me and uh it's it's really an honor to be here and, and getting this out. No, I I really appreciate it. Um, I know one of the reasons we get along is we're very similar in the fact that we like so many different things from different games, different genres, all the whole gamut. So so that's one of the reasons I think we've kind of clicked. And as far as your editing, man, you made a video for me that I really love. Um, I, your Killer Six videos for one of the top Borderlands YouTubers out there uh, they're amazing i've watched a ton of them so uh definitely definitely check this man out if you're interested in video editing i shout him out as often as possible because there's no one better that i've met so and honestly i hate editing i just do it myself most of the time because i am just it's just right there it's just easier for me but um, oh yeah well and that's the biggest thing that i found like when i was really exam well i mean i'll just here's a little personal history at at the time where i decided to do this i was actually working at, at my family's company uh, and it looked like i was coming to the place where i was going to lose that position uh, and i really wanted to do content creation full-time and i had heard over and over again from people how much they hated editing and everything <laughs> and and to me editing and the, editing is just this giant creative release yeah. like i just i really love it uh and so i thought well i could learn how to do that for people so that way you know creators can focus more on creating the content and not have to worry about the back end and let me handle the back end for you and 
it's it's been wonderful man it has really taken off i i know i appreciate all your in fact you were the one that got me plugged in with k6 to begin with yeah. i believe so i've <laughs> that really launched me from there and it's it's been awesome i've gotten to edit for a bunch of gamers i get to edit for self-help coaches for financial coaches for music producers like it has really been a joy yeah that's awesome and i uh my my goal one day is the to make it so where uh, if I'm doing well enough, then I can just have somebody edit my my videos, and I won't have to. I can just focus on the the creating of content, not the the editing. Because like like you said, man, you like it, and I know I know other people I've met who are editors who really enjoy finding like when they get a piece. It's like a, a piece of art, right? You put together oh, the is. perfect clip with the sound with the effects with everything. It's amazing, but I don't have that talent. So for me, it's just frustrating because I'm like, <laughs> oh, I can't get this to fit. And I've spent six hours on it. I'm wasting my time. But uh, for those <laughs> for those who have that, that eye for editing, it's amazing. And uh, like you said, it is super creative. I don't think editors get the uh, respect they deserve with regards to that either. So. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's 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 a real enjoyment for me. And, and like I said, you were one of the people that helped really pushed me in that direction to begin with and it's just been all it's been all uphill from there i i i love every minute of it yeah anything i can do to help the homies grow is is always something that i'm gonna try to do as much as possible so anyway let's get into the subjects for the week i am kind of excited because it's been slow news wise but there's still so many topics to tackle that have piqued my interest like the gaming world is in a lull with new releases, and yet random things pop up that are super exciting. We've got the landscape changing because of COVID as far as movies and TVs and stuff. Uh, all the time. Like, all the time. Something else is happening that is going to catch everybody off guard. First off, I wanted to talk about Outriders. Now, for those of you who don't know, it's a new game coming from Square Enix. Some have called it... A looter shooter but it's not an ongoing game it's not a, a permanent world like a destiny might be it's i would kind of say it's more like a borderlands in mm -hmm. the way that it's handled as far as it's a complete game but there is end game there is stuff to loot but it's not like an open world like mmo light or something of that nature it got delayed from february to april 1st no joke no april fools april 1st is the actual <laughs> launch um, it's a third-person game, which is interesting. We haven't seen a lot like that that are third-person. And then it's going to be featuring a free-to-play demo in February. What do you mm -hmm. think about the game? What have you seen from it? Uh, what are your thoughts about the demo? Instead of calling it a beta, that's kind of interesting to me as well. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, it, you know, it, it strikes me. First of all, yeah, I haven't followed outriders as closely like i remember seeing it when it was first announced and i am a big square enix fan i i like the kind of stuff that they put out i'm a big rpg player when i can play rpgs uh, when i actually have the time to sit down and invest into them yes and i love shooters so i mean like you marry those two things together i think that's why i love the borderlands franchise so much and and destiny and all of these games that combine the shooter uh elements with rpg elements so like this game really does sound incredibly interesting to me um am i surprised it got pushed back not really um just given the landscape that we're in right now uh you know you don't really think about how many different areas of society are affected by by the current world situation you know with us being in this pandemic and everything game developers are struggling too you know they can't go to their offices they can't interact with each other like they used to be able to so stuff is going to be pushed back or stuff is going to come out slower and it's one of those things that really doesn't surprise me given the state of the world right now and i'm glad that they're only pushing it to april as opposed to you know i mean you and i have been in the gaming community to remember some of some of the development hells that have gone on over the years so uh, the fact that it's you know the fact that they're actually taking the time to hopefully get it right I, i'm always a bigger fan of developers pushing a project 
taking the time to get it right than forcing something out and patching it to a playable state later on. Yeah. Like that, that always just drives me crazy <laughs> when developers think it's okay to release a half finished or a messy project and just be like, it's okay, everybody, you know, a year from now, this is going to be one of the best games you've ever played, but you know, suffer with us right now. Uh, I would much prefer that they go ahead and push it back and, and take some time and allow the process to really work. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I agree with that. I think something that's hard, right, is that sometimes games, you need to decide when to just push it live because, yeah, like, the ongoing games are like your Destiny, like your MMOs, like even your COD games, your, your PvP games that are like that Battle Royales. There are going to be issues that are going to arise, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's just inevitable when you scale up from your testers who mm -hmm. are a small number compared to the number of players who are going to actually play the game. So there's going to be issues. I understand that. But I'm with you in that not only for making the game as full as possible, but like one thing I've noticed is that, and this is where I think these games, if you're going to launch another destiny type game even though outriders mm -hmm. isn't necessarily that but even with outriders if you're gonna launch a game that has end game it's gotta be ready from the start even if you don't launch with it so yes one of the problems that avengers has had right uh, a lot of people paying that game i still really enjoy it i still play the game uh and it's the same kind of concept that borderlands has had issues with uh, with regards to the third installment, it's almost the same thing that Destiny has at times. When you don't have that ready, now your team has to shift and fix all the bugs and the issues that are popping up with an ongoing game or with a game yeah. that, that has end game, right? So all of your, your stuff that you had planned, your roadmap, it all gets delayed. So now yeah. you have lost too much of your player base from the time that... You went from uh, from launch until your end game is ready and you've actually been able to put it out and fix bugs and stuff. That has to be ready from the beginning. And I know you've got hard deadlines, but that's got to be a number one priority. And that's one thing that I hope Outriders, even though it's not an ongoing game, I hope if it's a game that has end game, it's ready right at launch. If you want the yeah. players to keep playing after they go... Through the campaign, you need that extra content to be ready. Or if not, right at launch, it's got to be dropping a week, two weeks after, like really fast, as soon as people get through the campaign. Because you and I both know developers seem to always underestimate how quickly players will chew up content. Oh, yeah. And I was just about to say that. I mean, a lot of developers seem to have this naive thought that like, okay, we'll put this out and you know, we're going to have in game and it's not ready right now, but don't worry. It's going to be ready six months from now. And we don't have to worry because surely nobody is going to consume the entire thing in that time period. But then you always have like that group of players. that's like a week later while well, I'm done. Yeah. You know, like I've, I've literally done everything. Now I'm going to sit here and wait for end game stuff. So uh, it's, I don't know why a lot of developers have this thought that like, like you said, underestimating their player base. Well, I like don't. These, there are. I don't know if it's necessarily just the developers. It's obviously higher ups, board members, people who are in charge oh, yeah, of, yeah. of costs and stuff. So it's a combination of a lot of things, and I think that's the hard part, right? Is that everybody wants to be successful and make money, but if you're going to be successful long term. Right, mm -hmm. your launch has to be good, and your first month is crucial, and oh, that's yeah. the one thing. Like you look at Cyberpunk, the oh. damage that that's done to that uh, developer to that brand is going to take a long time to fix. You look at some of the problems. You look at Bioware with Anthem, with uh, the latest with Mass Effect Andromeda. These mm -hmm. companies are finding it hard to bounce back because they weren't ready at launch. And there's a lot yeah. of reasons that that might be the case. But at the end of the day, a 
Subpar launch will ruin a game for a long time. Some will bounce back like No Man's Sky, but even that never bounced back to the heights that it could have been. Um, so I, it's it's tainted, right? Yeah. Like it it'll always have this 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 tainted yeah. feeling about it. And I've I've played. I mean, No Man's Sky is is basically like the perfect example, right? Because there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes of No Man's Sky when it was released. But when it was released, in the state that it was released in, we all turned around as players. And I was guilty of it, too. Turned around and said the developers are liars. You know, they promised us all of this and nothing of that is in the game and blah, blah, blah. And obviously, we didn't know everything that was going on behind the scenes. And, And I've played No Man's Sky since it has become really the gem that it is now i mean it really is a wonderful game now with so much to do and i definitely encourage everybody to to check it out but like it's really the perfect example of how that first week that first two weeks can ruin something in the public's mind for a very very long time no because there are still people i know that i've told play no man's sky you'll enjoy it and they'll be like hey isn't that that game where like the developers lied to everybody and i don't want to support them i'm like no they did okay uh now i gotta go on this whole diatribe yeah yeah you know? so it's... yeah people just don't want to get into it fallout 76 is another great example of that oh, Lord. where it's like uh the people who still play fallout 76 really enjoy it now right just <laughs> like uh a lot of games that people still enjoy that that started off really rocky it's just a shame that the player base is so much lower than it potentially could have been. Because I'll tell you what, man, the thing that's missing from these ongoing games is exactly what Fallout 76 provides. The Rust-like survival aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But they just made so many missteps with regards to launch that you're just never going to get enough people back on the train to make it... uh, as popular as it once could have been and that's really unfortunate um yeah as far as outriders do you think you would try out the demo or you think the demo would be enough to win you over if it's good enough i mean look i am never i will never ever object to developers putting out any kind of a demo Mm -hmm. any kind of a beta test anything like that now obviously those things don't always tell the full truth sure. of what the the actual game is going to be um but at least it's something yeah. you know a lot of times with these pushback and pushback and pushback uh that these titles get you know if the players just had something in their hands that they could look at and get excited about maybe that would help them kind of weather the storm of development hell yeah so the fact what? that they're willing to put out something yeah in february to at least you know wet the appetite a little bit you know i'm willing to give it a shot and gosh demos have kind of become a thing of the past really haven't they i mean well when you said the word demo i was like oh man i haven't heard that word in a while yeah (laughs) a lot of companies go with beta but the beta feels like it's a work in progress where demo seems like a a finished portion of the game so you should know exactly what to expect now i not ironically but funny enough the game that had the demo that excited me the most recently, Final Fantasy VII Remake. I was yeah. skeptical skeptical about that game. And then I played the demo and I was like, okay, this feels like Final Fantasy VII. But it feels new and exciting. And, and after Final Fantasy XV, I was unsure if I was going to dive into it. But honestly, that demo changed my mind quite a bit. And so... Square Enix seems to be one of the developers who's like, okay, we understand what we can deliver. We can make these demos feel really good. And for the players interested in that game, it'll give them a little bit of uh, hype and a little bit of something to grab onto and be like, you know what? I like the way this game feels. So I'll probably give it the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, and I mean, Square Enix obviously is one of the, you know, tried and true developers uh, or i don't i don't know they're not developing outriders right they're just publishing it publishing, yeah yeah I was, um but they know how to market yeah i mean do you remember back when when we were kids and you would get like the playstation magazine and yeah. it would have like the 
the disc in the back that had like 15 little demos on it and then yep. you would play it and then you would start begging your parents or saving your allowance to go buy those games like demos work and so like i'm i'm glad that they're doing this so square enix knows what they're doing um i can't remember the name of the developer it's people can fly right they're the ones who are developing outriders uh yeah. yes yeah yeah so i and like i don't i don't know too much about people can fly i don't know let's see i think they did bullet storm was mm-hmm. a game that they did back in the day um but uh you know teaming up with with the tried and true publisher like square enix like they, they know what they're doing yep. and so i think this is not a mistake making a demo i think it could only help to kind of get more people on board as they wait for the actual release and i hope that they know what they're doing in the sense of that release date um and and i just hope it doesn't get pushed back again yeah. obviously I, I want game, i i said earlier that i i'm fine with letting the process take its course but i'm also a gamer and gamers are impatient yeah. and i want to have it now so well, i hope it doesn't get pushed back again because i would really like to try this thing out and i'm hoping the demo can can provide us with a little bit of that a taste, a I taste think of what we're going to get. The problem with it getting pushed back multiple times is now you yeah. seem to think now you like in Cyberpunk's case, I start to question the leadership. Like if they didn't realize they were going to need extra time multiple times, mm-hmm. now you start to wonder. And it's that game still releasing the mess that it was on on multiple platforms. That's when you start to question, okay, are they just making bad decisions for... Like, obviously, Cyberpunk, in my opinion, rushed out to get out by holiday and uh, before Christmas. That's the number one reason it was pushed out beforehand. That game could have used six more months in the in the cooker. Um, yeah. But uh, at some point, you got to release, like I said. And uh, I just think that... Too much bad management at the top uh, will ruin all the hard work of the awesome developers, and that is one of the more frustrating things for me from what I've seen. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm totally on board with that. It, it, it's really a lot of these releases that we've talked about that have been these quote-unquote botched releases or bad games that launch, you know. A lot of it has nothing to do with the developers themselves. I mean, these people are working their butts off to produce a quality piece of product it's and a quality experience most of them are gamers them are themselves you know they know what we want but it's these you know the and i won't get too uh, crazy on bashing you know the front office or whatever on on these titles i don't know what goes on yeah but you you get the sense that the front office is the one that makes these kind of decisions and that's what's really frustrating and sometimes i mean i'm sure it's sometimes unavoidable with uh monetary restraints budget restrictions etc like you never know what the the whole idea is but but i'm with you that i feel like it's hard to uh judge the developers themselves so um, anyway uh that's just one piece of the gaming pie that i wanted to talk about today we also had some exciting and interesting news from Lucasfilm Games. They have announced that they will be taking over the entirety of the Star Wars franchise, uh, the gaming division, and also now is going to be releasing, in conjunction with uh, Bethesda, a Indiana Jones game. So Mm -hmm. this kind of coincides with the just the revival of Star Wars. Ever since... uh, we had Rise of Skywalker, which was not well received. But then going from there to The Mandalorian. And after The Mandalorian, we had the announcement of, I mean, more shows and movies than I can count uh, from the Star Wars franchise. And I'm excited about that for sure. Now that the games division is under their care, including like you have games, uh, you have. Um, What's the the newest Star Wars game? 
Squadrons. Well, Squadrons, <laughs> yeah. And you have that, and then you have the other, the standalone Star Wars game, the... the oh, Jedi Fallen Order? Fallen Order, yeah. I didn't play that yeah. one as of yet, but uh, they feel they're so different in the genres that they're in, but still being under the Star Wars franchise. So what do you think about where, how they might be tied in together, where the Star Wars gaming genre franchises heading and all that kind of good stuff and then kind of touch on the indiana jones game as well yeah well i mean okay so i'm a huge star wars fan and really i'm a big lucas films fan in general because you know i'm also a big indiana jones fan i grew up watching this stuff like this is my childhood personified yeah. right um so and it's funny because Star Wars games over the years, like if we go all the way back to like the original Lucas games and stuff like that, they've always been kind of hit or miss. Yeah. You can point to and, and say like those were real jewels of games. And then there are some that were just kind of like, eh, it just, just didn't quite hit it. Like just didn't quite get there. Uh, and then of course, with all the fiasco that happened with, uh, uh, Battlefront 2 and their loot crate system and what basically became pay to win and all that garbage. Um, you know, I'm I'm glad that they are stepping back in and that they are doing better because uh, these last two Star Wars games have been have been pretty damn good. I don't know if I can swear on this podcast or not. Yeah, but yeah I go, did, on, go so on. Deal with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> By all means. Uh, uh, They've been pretty damn good. Uh, Fallen Order was 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 good. I liked it. Squadrons looks amazing. I have yet to really get my hands on it, and I really really want to because I love dogfighting games too. Uh, just I was a big Rogue Squadron player back in the day on the N sixty four, and like that was that was ah uh, the creme de la creme. So I I really really want to touch uh squadrons at some point here but i mean we'll see it, it's lucas film has just had such a it's it's been tumultuous if if that's the right word like yeah. it's been big highs it's been big lows um i was one of the people that was really not sure what disney was going to do when they took over lucas film mm -hmm. um i've been pretty happy with the results so far uh, under this, under their management, Star Wars has been, it's been Star Wars, and it hasn't been too terrible. Uh, I haven't been as angry as I was when the prequels were released back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I think that, and, and especially since now they're willing to look at titles outside of Star Wars, because um, there were Indiana Jones games that were made back in the day. I remember renting those from Blockbuster when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Dating, dating yourself. And yeah. me, I, I remember that as well. Oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, come on. We're a couple of old guys talking about video games. What else are we going to do? It's true. It's um, true. But, you know, so the, the fact that they're willing to now point the lens outside of Star Wars and try something else I'm excited about that. Yeah. And and I think Indiana Jones is a franchise that is in desperate need of a little TLC, um, considering where it had been before. Uh, so if we can get a decent Indiana Jones game, I'm going to be all over that. Absolutely all over that. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you on that for sure. Star Wars is interesting. I am fully invested in the updated star wars uh movement as far as the shows the games i'm excited to try those out and test see how good they do i'm excited that they're finally going to be unified under one banner uh like you said this battlefront is was a perfect example of the same thing we were talking about it ultimately was a solid game it just launched so poorly that it just never recovered there were a lot of good things about Battlefront, and it was really fun to play once you got past some of the nonsense. And unfortunately, yeah. the nonsense made the launch a hot mess. And there's not that that's that's what it is. It's if anything can be taken from developers, get launch right. Even if it takes delays, even if there's uh, whatever you got to do, launch has to be solid. It doesn't have to be perfect. But it's got to be good enough 
and no major drawbacks because that's ultimately what will kill it. As far as Indiana Jones goes, what I'm curious about is how they're going to make it feel different from franchises like Uncharted, Tomb Raider, those kind of things that we've seen a lot of the Indiana Jones-like adventures. How are they going to make it feel like i know indiana jones is a different franchise than those but how are they going to make it feel special in comparison with those franchises that have already had so many titles release doing a similar thing that we you kind of don't want it to be redundant you don't want it to feel the same as any of those you know what i'm saying yeah and i think we're gonna have a little bit of that like i think that's slightly unavoidable and the only reason i say that is because uncharted like if you if you think back to when uncharted was released like that was the indiana jones game i had been waiting for it yes. just wasn't called indiana jones yeah 100 percent. you know it was it was called uncharted and nathan drake it was an incredible character it was an incredible franchise and it set the bar for that kind of adventure saga type game so I think you're going to see influences from Uncharted, influences from the new Tomb Raider. Um, well, I say new, but it's you know basically the Tomb Raider relaunch or whatever that started back on the PS4. Um, but so I think that's completely unavoidable. Like there will be elements that will feel very similar, just because though that game, Uncharted in particular, nailed indiana jones without it being called indiana jones yeah um i think the thing that will push this game not if not over those games like it will at least let it sit in the same breath as those games is if they get the character of indy right yeah because i think about the worst thing they could do is release an indiana jones game and it not feel like indie yeah you know like there it will be a special layer of hell that they can go to yeah. if they screw up indiana jones yeah and, and and that's just the way that i feel about it but i i think that they definitely have the ability to do it and and i think the touch of uncharted and the touch of tomb raider like you you take the best elements from those games but then you make it your own with this character that we all wish had been Uncharted. Yep. You know, we all, anybody who was an Indiana Jones fan, you couldn't play Uncharted and not think, oh my God, this is an Indiana Jones game. Yeah. It's just not called Indiana Jones. So, you know, I, I think it will be a little bit unavoidable, but I, I really hope that they just nail the feel, the the beauty of the character that is Indiana Jones. Yeah. No, I think you hit the nail on the head with regards to you, the character being the number one differentiating factor, like the number one thing that's going to sink or swim that franchise. If they can, oh, yeah. if they can make Indiana Jones feel like Indiana Jones from our childhood, from uh, early Harrison Ford, awesome indiana mm -hmm. jones you know what i'm saying that's sometimes where critics of fav long favorite franchises their biggest frustration is often with a character not feeling like that character whether it's the intention of the original creator or not but if the character just feels drastically different from what you remember it's going to cause some issues so get it capturing yep. that feel of indiana jones i think is vitally important and i agree with that 100 percent I'm excited. I hope Lucasfilm does more uh, a variety of games and not just Star Wars. I hope this is a turning point in the Star Wars video game revolution, at just like the TV uh, shows on Disney Plus, the movies. Hopefully, we start to see a lot more consistency from them because I think the biggest problem is they've been up and down, right? Yes. whatever your your thoughts are on the new trilogy the biggest problem is that they felt like they didn't fit as a trilogy in my opinion with the two different 
directors training back and forth. So that's fine to do if you have standalone movies, but not with the trilogy. So if we have, you look right. at the MCU and what they do so great is that Thor and Captain America and Iron Man and all these different Guardians of the Galaxy, all of these movies are different movies because they're not trying to be the same movie in the same uh, kind of, in a trilogy, in a, a consecutive pattern. Instead, they're their own thing within this overarching universe. And we've got so much with this one narrative, nine movies focused on this one singular path. If this last trilogy had veered off and been its own thing, I think we would have been fine. If these movie, new movies veer off, you can include favorite characters from the past. Look at The Mandalorian. I don't want to spoil anything, but the last episode had a major appearance from a character everybody knows. You know? Uh -huh. So, that's how you, that's more like how you're supposed to do it, is... Touch on the lore, the have these brief introductions of characters, but like they don't always all need to be focused on the same singular narrative. And that's the one thing I hope Star Wars learns between all of their games going forward. I hope they learn, I hope they fix the Battlefront franchise because that game, I played Battlefront 2 a lot a year after it launched. And from there, once it was inexpensive and the loot box issue was fixed. And it was a really good, it was a really fun game. It could have been so much more had they not botched the launch. So hopefully they've learned that lesson. And... It's... Well, and here's the thing, right? Like, with any kind of franchise like Star Wars, like Indiana Jones, these super beloved, or, or I'll even point to another franchise that has nothing to do with Lucasfilm, but later this year there's a, a big Harry Potter game that's coming out for the PS5 and, mm -hmm. and it's it's like the first basically Harry Potter MMO that's coming out. Harry Potter, major franchise. Anytime that you start tinkering around in these worlds of these major franchises with these super dedicated fans, you are playing Russian Roulette. You, you better get it right or else you will be haunted by it forever. They will never, ever, ever let you forget it. Yeah, and you know I'm I'm so glad that Lucas Lucasfilm Games you know it was Lucas game Lucas Arts it was Lucas Arts back yeah, in the day yeah. right was uh -huh. the, the game company that made the Lucas games yeah I'm I'm glad that they are willing to try new things other than Star Wars because you can make Star Wars games all the time until the cows come home there's plenty of things you can do with Star Wars. I'm glad that they're willing to step out of that and look at something else and try something else and do something as beloved in it as Indiana Jones. And I am also scared as hell because I don't want them to screw it up. <laughs> like, I, I'm just, I really don't want them I, to screw it up. I feel like up. that's the hard part. And that's why I think a game like Fallen Order can succeed where other things have, like when you have a new character in the universe there's no expectations. There's no... Oh, yeah. Uh, like, Indiana Jones, you're supposed to know how that character is. It's not a fresh character, not someone you can mold from, from nothing. So I think, I mean, I think that's the way to go, hopefully, with a lot of the other games. Although, Indiana Jones, I think, is a smart move. I will say, though, if you give me either a Mandalorian or a Bounty Hunter type of game with no Force powers in the... Star Wars universe, sold. Give me an open world, like, maybe not Destiny-like, but, but kind of combine Skyrim open world with, like, uh, Battlefront gameplay. Yeah. Something, I mean, give like, me something like I like said, <laughs> with Star Wars, there are so many avenues you can go down. Yeah. So I'm, I am glad that they're they're stepping outside of it because, I mean, the last three Star Wars games have been pretty damn decent yeah so let's let's let those games boil a little bit and let's step outside but i mean they've done stuff like that with the star wars franchise if we go all the way back you know like dark forces was a game i remember star wars dark forces it was like basically a star wars version of doom you know or like uh, uh they did do a bounty hunter game star wars bounty hunter uh which 
was basically following the story of Django Fett. And that one, you know, no force powers. It was all gunplay. It was all, you know, pretty classic. I think it was the PS3. It might have been the PS2. I can't remember. Um, but, you know, they've, they've shown that they can do stuff beyond just, like, you're a Jedi now. <laughs> so hopefully, you know, hopefully they, they start experimenting a little bit more. But I am glad they're putting Star Wars aside for just a second and trying something new with the wonderful titles that they have available to them. Yeah, no, I agree with that for sure. Now, uh, next, I wanted to talk to you because we are both huge esports guys. Like, I pay attention far more than I should. Uh, games I don't even play, I will pay attention to the finals of major tournaments. I watch the Fortnite World Cup. I'll watch the COD League when it's the finals. Uh what uh we're gonna touch on two things but first i want to see what of all the games out now or potentially coming out or genres where do you see esports going from here and what do you think is going to be the next major step for esports oh boy esports is hard right now it's it's hard to it's hard to really pin down esports right now because i think Honestly, I, I think that esports has one direction to go, and that's up. Uh, we're in a day and age where, you know, with this pandemic, with like, it, you know, real sports, or you could say, quote unquote, real sports, have just like, we almost had a full year without any actual sports. And I was like, oh, this is esports' opportunity to really step into the limelight. And they kind of missed that opportunity a little bit. Um, I know that there were some esports that got some like actual national syndication while all the other sports were down. Like I think Hearthstone was getting some feature on ESPN. Uh, I've been following the uh, the Overwatch League because I think that it's an incredibly well produced esport uh, in general. Um, but I really think esports is only going to go up from here just because it is so <sighs> what's what's the right word it it feels so obtainable. Hmm. Does that make sense mm-hmm. like like as a kid, when I'm sitting on the couch watching football or something like that, it's like, oh, I want to do that, okay, well, then this is what you gotta do you gotta. You got to start working out. You got to start playing football. Oh, wait, you're 13? Well, you probably already missed your shot because uh, you should have started playing football when you were fresh out of the womb in order to have a shot at getting to the pros and blah, blah, blah. But esports has this very unique, like, everybody sits down, can watch an esport, and then be like, ah, oh, man, I feel like I could do that if I just practiced enough or if I just played enough, you know? It, it's got this draw that I feel like is kind of missing from professional quote unquote real sports nowadays. And I can, I can only see it going up from here now as to what the next big esport would be. That's tough because I feel like the landscape is so wide open that at this point, anything could be an esport. If only there was enough player interest a little bit of star power behind it and enough money to get it up off the ground. Yeah. Um, I personally feel like the overwatch league, I know it's kind of taken a dip uh, in the past, in the past year or so. It's kind of one of those that people are saying is on its way down, but the way that they produce like the show, but the way that they set up the league with having franchise teams from different places, like it, it it felt so powerfully like a sport the more I was watching it. Yeah. To the point where I went and bought uh, like Florida Mayhem gear just because yeah. I was like, nobody is going to know what this is when I wear it out in public. But it says Florida and an esports team under it. So I'm going to freaking buy this, you yeah. know? It was just like, it, it's hard for me to say which one I think could be the next big esport. Um, I think Fortnite obviously is one of the most popular games in the world right now still. Um, 
and you know you got so many young people like really young people playing that game and, and looking up to these major major fortnite streamers and uh esports players like i think fortnite is probably gonna be around in the esports team and get bigger uh over time but you know i i really can't pin down which game i think is the next big esport like did did you have something in mind where you were thinking well, a couple things. I think one, uh, just like sports were a little hurt with the pandemic, uh, esports as well. You look at the they didn't have major crowds, but you look at the Overwatch League, you look at COD League, and all those. They the lack of LAN events and the lack of crowds. I I do think hurt the productions just a little bit because they are very professional productions, and I think. Uh, I do think that that was definitely hurt a little bit by that, you know, um, and that's why you've seen a, a little dip in the numbers. And it'll be interesting to see if I know Overwatch 2 is supposed to be PVE centric, if I believe um, that that's been kind of word on the street. Yeah, it, uh, from what I under, I'm just a huge Overwatch head. So like, sorry, Um I think it's going to be like where where Overwatch One really didn't have any, or it actually literally doesn't have anything beyond the PvP experience that Overwatch is. Um, there is, go I don't know if it's a separate mode or if it's like a separate big chunk of the game is going to be PVE based. Um, but from what I understand, that is going to play a huge part in it. But I imagine the esports side of Overwatch 2 will still be pretty much what we see now. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, what I was, teams. yeah, I don't think that the actual experience will change. But I, what I was going to say is maybe a, a little bit of an updated feel to the game. Because one of the, the hard parts with your longtime esports like uh, CSGO, like Overwatch, yeah. is at some point they kind of feel a little bit like the same thing like cod does it because cod feels different every year because it's a different cod game even though in general cod feels mostly the same uh sometimes they switch to more or less players whatever i don't think you can do anything like that with overwatch but it'd be interesting to see if they got an updated rule set or updated uh, some kind of something some update with overwatch 2 that made it feel a little bit fresh even though it's not like you, you look at Fortnite when they have their next World Cup. They're going to be the map is going to be completely different. The guns that are in the game are going to be very different compared to what we got the last one. So it, I think that's one of the things that might be missing a little bit from Overwatch. But at the same time, you don't want too much of a change before a major event and to throw everybody off. As far as uh, what I see is the next major one. I've been watching uh, like end of tournament Valorant games, and that one captures me in a way that like CS:GO never will. Just because it, it just looks so much, I don't know. It just looks more modern. You know what I'm saying? It's it sexy. Looks, yeah. I mean, let's, let's 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 be flat out. It's sexy. Valorant is sexy. And pros like, will, it is a sexy game. Yeah, pros will always complain a bit about the heroes right oh this one's overpowered this one's overplayed this one shouldn't be in the game blah 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 whatever the case may be but i feel like that adds enough variety to the game just like an overwatch that it doesn't feel like it's a strictly gun game you know what i'm saying it adds something like strategy with counterplay with the different characters learning to bait and and read abilities i really enjoy those type of games that's why i'm a big destiny fan that's why I, I like those types of games and why I think Valorant has the potential. Not only that, but they've... So a lot of games that I see launch, right away they're like, this is going to be a competitive esports game. Valorant mm -hmm. said it was going to be a competitive game from the jump, but they have been slow to roll out their tournaments, and it feels like they're really trying to get everything right with every step of the way. Uh, Riot well, obviously does yeah. a good job. They know what they're doing with that, but that's one thing that I've seen so far. 
I think I think Riot was scared of it being a quick burnout, um, just because of you know League of Legends is one of those that you can point to and say it's it's a it's a major major esport that is probably on the decline a little bit, and it has some I think it has a lot to do with the point you were making before of, of the game just not of being tired like the game itself is tired gamers we we always want something new right we always want something fresh there's a reason why a lot of professional sports you know like the rules for football haven't changed that very haven't changed very much (laughs) over over the years and years and years that the game has been played for sure but but that had a certain staying power because it wasn't a video game yeah you know gamers always want something new and like with uh with the league of legends esports scene like it's still a, a major esport and it's still one that i like to watch just because i i really enjoy the intrigue of a boba but i think riot was afraid of valorant being a quick burnout if they threw everything out there immediately um and we've seen that happen with other games that were released where the developer was like this is an esport <laughs> yeah this is an esport game um they burnt out they burnt out fast and i think valorant has taken its time to catch on and part of that is probably um the way riot games has rolled out their their esports scene it's been very controlled it's been very deliberate that's the word i was looking for deliberate it's been a very deliberate rollout very paced very easing people into it because you know valorant is going to have to draw a lot of fans from csgo and csgo fans are like some of the most die hard yeah i will only play csgo i only love csgo nothing will take me away from my precious csgo even though this game has been around since dinosaurs walked the earth you know like so i i think they've been trying to draw people on that front they've been trying to draw in the people that enjoy you know the hero games like overwatch like uh league of legends any of these moba type games they're trying to pull from two very well established franchises into this new franchise and and i have yet to really sink my teeth deeply into valorant uh i love the idea uh but i haven't played around with it too much yet um I wanted to wait until I was kind of sure the direction that game was going to take, but I think I have a pretty good picture of it. And, uh, and yeah, I could definitely see it being a big eSport just because it does combine these two already well-established eSports. You know, you've got the gunplay of CSGO, you've got the, the strategy of CSGO, and then you have the intrigue of a MOBA in the sense of, like, uh, counterpicking heroes. Um establishing a hero meta you know who is strong against this hero who is strong against this hero you know that's that's something that is very 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 interesting to me and and i would love to see where valorant goes yeah i i think yeah it's so interesting because fortnite is super popular with fans because of its ever-evolving landscape it constantly is changing but that's one of the reasons that pros, especially long-time pros, hate it. You know? Like, they right. don't like the fact that that's not a, I'm going to grind every day and get good with these different weapons. And then, oh, I got killed by some guy in a helicopter. They, that There are a lot of things that pop up in, in Fortnite that professional players will ultimately hate. Because it, it changes the game in a way that's not consistent. Pros love consistency. Uh, but well and, and and that's the big difference right like fortnite when it was released was never intended to be an esport yeah like i think it has it has reached that status and fortnite esports is actually pretty interesting to watch like yes. it's kind of cool yeah like I agree. It, it's really it's really fun like it's fun and that's that's what fortnite was was never intended to be an esport but it reached that status because it's fun and then you've got the hardcore pros that you know are frustrated with the fact that it is not a static game where they can pick out a meta where they could say, you know, I'm going to pick 
this sniper rifle because this sniper rifle counters your strategy, blah, blah, blah. Like, I think that there is a place in esports for a game like Fortnite because it is so zany, because it is so fun. Yeah. Like, it is just fun to watch. You don't have to be a really deep strategist to enjoy Fortnite esports. Yeah. Like, you have to with some of these other esports. Like, if I started rattling off, like, all of the this, if, if, if people used to hate when I would watch League of Legends esports back in the day because I would just start rattling off, you know, like, oh, I can't believe they picked this hero because it's it's not in the meta. This is an outside meta pick. They're going to get countered hardcore, and then they're going to get, you know, they're going to get pushed up middle, and, and everybody's looking at me like I got lobsters growing out of my ears. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I, I think that Fortnite is in a very unique place because it is so, so popular, and its popularity has basically pushed it into the esports scene exactly even though it was never intended to go there in the first place not and that's the double-edged sword that i think the that i feel like the pros oftentimes are missing right you have a game like that the only reason a lot of these people are able to make the amount of money and get the amount of attention they do is because of the popularity of fortnite the popularity of fortnite comes down to its ever-evolving landscape if yep. they were to do away with that, the game would lose popularity, and thus these pros who don't like to see the changes would lose out on money and potential growth. So it's yep. like you, you at some point you have to take a step back and be like, this is good for my career as a pro, even if it's frustrating to play it against at times. And that's how yep. like a game like Valorant which I feel like compared to a CSGO is easier on the eye and compared to a League of Legends is easier for a casual to watch and understand what's happening. Because of that, that's why I think, and it's got the the characters that look really cool. It's got awesome looking skins. And like those, some of their skins are unreal. They're super expensive, but they're unreal. Like a dragon that becomes part of your arm is an SMG. It's insane. So because of that, the way the game looks really nice and it combines very strategic gunplay and character abilities. And that's why I feel like that game has so much potential because it, it captures a lot of the elements. Now, we'll see how well Riot does in balancing everything going forward, how well it actually does take off because it is the one downside. And I play a game called Rogue Company, which is... The only real console PvP game like that, like its main game mode is Demolition, which is kind of like uh, plant the. It's the same thing. You plant the bomb, defend it, or you got to defuse the bomb if they. You know what I'm saying? Same thing. Right. Same concept as as a CS:GO as a Valorant. Although it's only four v four, it has characters. It's actually third person instead of first person, but. It's a casual version of those, and it's a game that's a lot of fun, and it's just launching its first season soon. I don't think it'll ever be an eSport majorly, because it just feels too casual friendly for that. Um, right. That being said, that casual friendly nature potentially could set up for some really cool things if they do tournaments down the line, because it's easier for me on my PS4 to play that game. I understand it. I've played, if I play 10 hours of it, you know what I'm saying? Compared to Valorant, which has such a high skill gap and high ceiling that it's hard for me to play unless I really dedicate myself to playing it. Real company, I can jump in and play and understand the game. And then under and then just like Fortnite, I, it's hard now because everyone's so good at building. But for a long time, even casual players could jump in and have a lot of fun with Fortnite. And then seeing at the highest level, that's really where I feel like the games can shine. Is like everyone plays COD, they watch the COD League. These people are doing it at the highest level, but you also are like, I've done this. Like you were saying earlier, I've done this. I could make that play. You know. Games like CS:GO are hard because they're 
League of Legends is a similar game that they're less relatable to a lot more casual fans, you know. And I, I feel like yeah. that's an interesting idea on which way like esports will really head when it comes to viewership and, and that's balancing between what the pros want and what the fans want. And I think those are going to be opposed at times. Oh yeah, definitely. And, and I think that I think esports in general can always benefit from games that are more casual friendly becoming professional games like Fortnite has shown that it's capable of doing. Um, just cause like you said, it, it gives the viewer that, that sense of like, Oh, I could do this. You know, it's relatability. It's I'm having fun and I don't need to know every minute detail of everything that's going down. You know, like I can watch this and have fun watching it as opposed to, you know, something like League of Legends or something like Overwatch or something like CSGO where you could watch it and have fun, but you have no idea what the hell is going on, you know? Um, so I, I think esports can really benefit from these more casual, friendly games doing well enough to propel a pro scene. Yeah. You'll always find pros. You know, you will always find people that are just that good at whatever game it is that they could compete at the highest level. It's it's more about you know finding the sponsors, finding people that are willing to put money behind the game to elevate it to a position where it could be an esport. Mm -hmm. You know, Fortnite is kind of an odd fish because that one didn't have a lot of investment behind it, and it is at that level just because it's Fortnite. Yeah, you know, it's, it's the most so popular, popular game yeah. in the world. It is. Whether you love it or hate love it or hate it, it is the most popular game in the world. Yeah. Like it just is. Hmm. So you know, and we haven't seen too many of those over the years. No. There aren't too many examples that I can point to, like a Fortnite, where it's a casual game experience that was just elevated to such a high level that it has become a completely different animal, you know? Yeah, for sure. And one, one game we haven't mentioned at all, which is coming out this year, Halo 5. Halo is one of the OG esports games. Yes, and... it is, sir. I, I used to travel around all over the state of Florida and play uh, Halo tournaments, like way back in the day. We're talking Halo 2 days before there was like, you know, a, a real MLG scene or anything like that. But Halo is one of the, the top dogs, the OGs. Yeah, and we'll see how that goes because there's every chance that that could burst on the scene. Now, that is a funny enough, a full circle part of our conversation because uh halo 5 is a game that got delayed uh there was rumors there was suspicion i don't know if they officially announced it but everyone was thinking it was going to be launching as a launch title with the series x obviously that didn't happen pushed back well into looking like fall of 2021 after a lot of pushback on the uh, initial looks and that's a game that if it comes out and launches good, could be a major game changer with regards to not only the esports industry and stuff like that, but also the competitors as far as you got Destiny and that kind of thing. Like filling that gap, see what lessons they've learned, what the game entails between the story, between does it have end game, does it have like how do how do they approach that in total so that's one that i'm excited to see what happens with that one because there's so many and we're people. talking we're talking about halo infinite right no halo 5 is he, oh halo 5 has been out oh, what is it 5 or infinite maybe i'm wrong that's yeah. my fault infinite infinite would be halo 6 cuz halo 5 was uh was a while ago that halo 5 came okay out, 6 we're that's what halo I meant. yeah yeah yeah. My fault. I'm not. I, I'll be honest. I've not. Um, I'm. I've always been a PlayStation guy, just because that's what I've had in my house. I have not actually played any of the Halo games. I've watched Halo esports. I've seen them. I've watched my friends play them. I've never played a Halo game. So 
Uh, yeah, Halo Infinite is what I was talking about. That's the one that got delayed. Um, yeah. But anyway, that's one that, that again, that could potentially uh, be a landscape changer with regards to esports. Yeah, I mean, and there are games like, you know, Halo kind of falls into the same category to me as like COD. You know, these games that have had multiple releases have found ways to keep it fresh and still have a pretty dedicated fan base, you know? Like, the, the people that play Halo at the highest level will always play Halo at the highest level. The people that play COD at the highest level will always play COD at the highest level. Doesn't matter which COD gets released, doesn't matter. They'll do it. You know, so I, I Halo will definitely be an eSport. It has to be, just because it's already got a precedent. Uh, how big it will be, I think, just depends on how good Halo Infinite is. Because... You know, the, the people that I know are big Halo fans, and I was a big, pretty big Halo fan. Halo 5 was a little bit mm, lackluster, we could put it, to, to put it mildly. So I think everybody is very, very hopeful for a solid release for Halo Infinite. And uh, yeah, yeah, we'll have to see, because Fall 2021 is all they're saying to us right now. Yeah. And that's... Uh, that's depressing. <laughs> and there's been a lot of uh, various leaks on what's going to be included. At first, it was a uh, battle royale mode and said it's going to be big team battle 2.0. Some folks are talking mm. about there's there's so much going on with that title that we don't know about that. I think everyone's obviously got to wait and see. It's just one of all the games. That's the only game on the horizon that I've seen that I'm like, OK, of the unreleased games that could potentially slide into the esports industry. That's the only one that's really on the radar. Although Valorant kind of came out of nowhere. Fortnite, when it first launched, kind of came out of nowhere. So it'll be interesting. Uh, Apex Legends is another one. That one, yeah. uh, do you remember that stealth ass drop? Like that was crazy oh, yeah. uh, and almost unheard of. They uh, Over the weekend, there were rumors of a bunch of content creators who... We're, we're at a studio playing a game and then they all release their content at one time. That was one of the greatest launches, I think, of all time. Especially a, Apex, stealth, a stealth launch like that. Yeah. Apex was probably one of the few Battle Royale games that had a chance to knock Fortnite off of its perch. Yeah. Didn't quite get there, but it had a shot. And I think its release kind of had a lot to do with that. Yeah. Just because it was overnight. I mean, it was like, you know, you go to sleep and then you wake up and suddenly, what the heck is everybody talking about? What is this game? I've got yeah. to try it. Oh my God, it's good. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, I think what separates uh, Fortnite from most of its competitors, especially now, is the same thing that separates Minecraft from all its competitors. It's the creator mode. It's the ability to constantly be innovating with new and different things, whether it's mods for, for Minecraft or whether it's, like I said, you can build basically anything in the Fortnite creator mode. You can you can creative mode and you can... They, they constantly have new things happening and they're putting out content in a way that other games just can't compete with them at this time. So I feel like that's the only thing that's kind of separated Fortnite from all the competitors in the BR realm. But so true. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's about it. I, I think that touches on most of the things I wanted to talk about with regards to the esports and everything this evening. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on before we kind of take off? I oh, mean, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Everybody go watch esports for the love of God. Yeah, go watch it. Like, I, I know a lot of people are kind of like, uh, I don't I don't know if I want to get into that. Go watch it. Uh, especially a lot of these established esports leagues. It is just fun. Like, yeah. it is a lot of fun to watch. It's high, A lot of them are really high quality. It, it feels like you're watching a very professional thing. Like, it, it's hard to describe until you start watching it, but you get sucked in, man. Yeah. Like, I get sucked in watching esports. I, I really do. So if you haven't given esports a shot, any of your favorite games, there's bound to be an esport out there for it. Go check it out. Go check out your proceeds. Support that kind of stuff. 
hundred percent. I definitely agree. And I think even my wife, who's not a huge gamer, I got her. We were watching the Fortnite World Cup, and she had a blast with it. She likes watching some of the the tournaments and stuff, even though she doesn't understand a lot of it. It's still exciting to watch. So I think that's been awesome. Uh, yeah. So that's gonna do it for us tonight, Alec. Where can we find you again? Reminder about your channels. What? Yeah, absolutely. You can find me on Twitter at Alec the Cleric. Uh, if you're interested in my editing business, that would be at Transmute underscore media on twitter or you could just uh google transmutation media uh, i will be in the next couple of weeks I've, I've already established that i'm going to be relaunching my own content creation on top of my editing uh so you can check me out on youtube uh or on twitch i will be starting live streams again at some point at alec the cleric on both of those thank you so much for being on my guy i really appreciate it and uh yeah thank you everyone for tuning in make sure you like i said like comment subscribe whatever platform you're on hit the heart button that's on all of them you know what i'm saying it helps me out tremendously we're getting this ball rolling i've been very blessed to have some awesome guests on for the podcast so far and i'm excited to have more we got another great one for you next week so thanks as always for tuning in stopping by and hanging out my name is joe Perez. I'll catch you all later.